It's always a pleasure each year to talk to my fellow film critics and uh, it's always great to talk to Peter Malone, uh, film critic and part of the Catholic Film Office. Peter, welcome again to Movie Metropolis. Peter, thank you for the invitation. It's been a long time talking when I think over the years. It has, it has. We've been uh, chatting for quite a while. And uh, it, it's great to see that uh, cinemas are open again and that people are going back to the cinema. I'm glad that they're open. But now that you mentioned going back to the cinema, I find when I review and I tend to review films, I've got three centres near where I live, so I can go to the Baldwin, which has only 11 screens, I can go to the Rivoli, which is only seven or eight, and the Lido, which has eight. But I find I'm often the only one there or plus one. I, I'm surprised. I even went to see Avatar recently, and I thought I'll avoid the COVID crowds and go on a Friday afternoon at Baldwin. Uh, they'd obviously programmed too many sessions because there are only three others in the cinema. Yeah. And with so many others, um, there's just one other person there. Uh, I'm, I don't know whether there are sessions which I don't go to where there are a lot of people in the audience. Do you find that yourself? Look, I'm finding during the day, weekday, uh, audiences are sparse, but uh, evenings tend to be much better visited and the nova for example is is doing great business and uh friday and saturday nights at a number of cinemas they uh, the, i've observed they've done very they're doing very well so it does vary depending on the time and the film etc yes at baldwin um except just recently there's usually quite a number of uh people around of whom i'm looking one of the youngest but <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, but I, and they've got nice facilities for a cup of coffee and things like that. So I see more people at Baldwin than at the other two complex. Oh, sorry, the Lido, they, I think they cater for groups and for parties at times. Mm. So I suppose each each area has its own um, method of getting audiences. But um, it's been strange to see so many films. Um, for instance, I saw White Noise the other day. And there was one lady in there who was eager to have a chat. Yeah. So I was the only one there to have a chat with. But it was interesting to hear her views. But it's uh, it's strange, that kind of experience, when you hope to see a few more there at least. Yes, uh, exactly. But still, uh, we're, we're invited to a number of previews and, and um, we've both seen, I think, some films that are releasing in January. But, of course, that's a separate... Uh, list completely for next year. So, <laughs> yes. So let's talk. I'm about... finding that I, yes, I'm finding that I can't get to evening previews as often as I could in the past. Ah, and the previews at the Nova, because it's not all that far, but I have to get both a tram and a bus to get there. I've not been going and catching yeah. up everything then on release. I see, I see. Okay. All right. No, I understand. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about the year in review, 2022. And uh, Peter, what are your highlights, your best films of the year? Well, Peter, as you might remember, I tend to talk about the ones that appeal to me a lot rather than whether they're award winners and things like that. Fine. But I thought I'll just say something about um, the Australian films first, um, we're going to give our Catholic award to The Drover's Wife. Ah. So uh, I was very taken with that, actually, as, uh, for me, the Australian film of the year. And uh, the other one that I very much liked uh, was The Stranger. So yes. are they on your list at all? Uh, the Stranger, definitely. I, In fact, I think that that, for me, was the best Australian film of the year. Yes. I'm hesitant to say the other word. It has It's a five-letter word. And I've heard you pronounce it earlier in the year. It's called Elvis. 
<laughs> You're nothing but a hound dog, Peter. <laughs> no, I remember coming out of the preview, having enjoyed it, and then finding that you didn't. <laughs> so that, that, that was my hesitation because uh, I felt you had some strong views on Elvis. And did you uh, sit through the recent Actor Awards happily or with reservations? <laughs> I, I expected Elvis was going to win most of the awards. But, uh, look, that's fine. We all have different views. I, I had real problems with uh, Baz Luhrmann's film, but that's okay. If you liked it, you liked it. That's good. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, we'll see. See, he's got nominations, I see, over in the US, so yep. we'll see what happens. Yeah, I jotted them down in terms of um, as they came into my memory. So I've got um, I've got another seven films here. Yeah, uh, some some got awards, but some didn't. But I'm going to start with a film which really took me aback. Fina from New Zealand. Oh yes, Fina. Yes, yes, yes. A very good film. Yes, I th I thought it was excellent. I was. Not, I don't know what I was expecting, even with the pronunciation from the title, which sounds like Wina, but she was uh, Philomena Fina. So, yeah. But I thought its portrayal of New Zealand over the 20th century, of her and her Maori background and leadership, mm -hmm. the hardships in her life, and yet emerging as quite a leader, a bit shocked at the end to see how many uh, honours she had, Dame, um, and also uh, uh, all kinds of local ones. <clears throat> but I found it very engrossing, and I was very glad that I saw it. And it the thought came to me, wouldn't it be good if somebody could make the Australian equivalent of somebody significant like her in our history? It would be very, very interesting so those who've been in politics or poets like Kath Walker, all kinds of uh, possibilities. So for me, that was <clears throat> probably the most surprisingly interesting and enjoyable film of the year yep. in that sense. Um, next on my list, I see I've put Belfast, which I did enjoy. Mm. And I thought <clears throat> it really took took me into the troubles and a great admiration for Kenneth Branagh that he should pay this kind of tribute to his life and to his parents and grandparents. And um, I thought the boy was terrific. Uh, I was reminded of uh, Branagh's love of films by the excerpts and they're going to the pictures at various times, suddenly appearing in colour, Raquel Welsh in colour, whatever it was. But... Um, Kieran Hines and Judy Dench as his grandparents, I thought were just, uh, they were wonderful. Mm -hmm. So uh, I better check. Is Belfast on your list? <laughs> it, it's on my, uh, just outside my top 10 list. <laughs> right. Well, I'm staying in Ireland. <clears throat> I wrote down The Quiet Girl. Mm. And um, it was a very quiet film, but once again, Oh, interesting hearing the Gaelic. You don't often hear a Gaelic film. But the little girl herself and her performance and the contrast between her terrible life at home, hardships and being picked on, and then the cousins looking after her and a kind of choice at the end. What do you do? Where do you go and live for your, I suppose, health and sanity as well? So um, I thought I'll put The Quiet Girl on the list. Yep. Now, I've got one which I'm not sure whether it got a cinema release, but I saw it on Netflix. Can I say that one? Sure. Bombardment. Yeah, it didn't get a cinema release. Yeah. Ah. I was very taken with Bombardment. Okay. And uh, I suppose we've seen many war stories, but the personalised story in bombardment and the bombing of the Danish school in Copenhagen by mistake and the consequences, I found very moving, often quite harrowing. So it's one of the, I suppose, one of the key war films now that takes its place in my memory. 
Okay. So uh, I came across it on uh, on Netflix and I watched it and I'm very glad that I did. Hmm. Um, I've got She Said. I've, I'm surprised that that didn't do as well as I imagined it would. Yeah. Is it's there a like... reason why? <laughs> It didn't do know. well in the US, I don't think. Yeah, I, it, it's hard to say why. I mean, the investigative journalism films are, are, are very good, and uh, this is another good example. I don't know. Maybe the Me Too movement, uh, a lot of people felt they were already over it. Who knows? Yes, I, I thought the two women were very good. Mm. Uh, Patricia Clarkson and Andre Bro are very good. But if I were getting nominations for awards... I'd have Samantha Morton and um, Jennifer Ely. I just thought, well, they just, mainly were just sitting in chairs talking. Mm. But the way that they communicated their experience mm. and the two, one rather hard and the other more emotional as she had the terminal cancer, they were for me highlights of the year, those two performances mm. in a film that I really admired very much. Yes, yeah, so, hello, the Americans. I think it was very good. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, now, another one, and again, this one, I was the only one in the cinema, which was just as well because at the end, I didn't have to be embarrassed wiping the tear from my eye. <laughs> so it was nowhere special. Ah. Uh with James Norton. Yeah. For me, it was just a lovely film. And his relationship with this little boy. And I looked it up. James Norton has no family, no children. Uh, so his rapport with this little boy who played his son, age three, if I remember, or four, um, and his quest to find parents with whom he could leave the boy because of his terminal illness. Mm. I thought James Norton was terrific. The boy was marvellous. Small film, but for me, a lovely film. And I was very glad that I saw it. And I have one more. Ennio. Ah. I really enjoyed Ennio Morricone. Yeah. And it was a portrait. I felt it was a master class. Uh, it was wonderful on his career and so many interviews with him. And, of course the enjoyment of hearing all that well-known music in its context. I had forgotten Once Upon a Time in America. Mm. So it was, I thought that was beautifully done, mm. but glad to hear the mission. Glad they showed the scene where he didn't get the Oscar. Yeah. Uh, Lord Putnam apologising afterwards. <laughs> then his uh, life career. But I had forgotten completely when Tarantino came into the film with such gusto that, in fact, uh, he'd done The Hateful Eight and got yes. the Oscar for it. Yes. yes. So um, I really did enjoy that, just the whole experience of looking and listening and hearing the music. I fully agree. <laughs> in fact, it was my... Now, can I... Yes, go yeah. on. Oh, no, oh, you were going to say... Oh, I was just going to say, uh, Ennio, uh, The Maestro, was my number one documentary of the year. Yes. Yeah. Well, I've got a number two documentary, amongst many others. Sure. And that was Spli Splice Here. Oh, Splice Here, yes, uh, the filmmaker's journey. Uh, the um, uh, Yes, yes, very good. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed that. Yes. And I had to confess, Peter, that in 1952-53, years when I was showing films at our boarding school and we had the 16mm prints and we had one, now here's a test for your memory, do you remember Julia Misbehaves? Yes, I think I, I do, I do, yes. Greer Garson, yes. Walter Pigeon, Elizabeth yes. Taylor. Yes. Anyhow, of all people... Uh, Julia, um, Greer Garson as Julia was a music hall star and she performed uh, a song in it showing a bit of leg. Now, this is 1953, boys' boarding school. So, in fact, we cut the film 
And that's my main, my main memory of splicing, which we didn't see actually in the documentary, much splicing at all. But anyhow, we put it together and MGM didn't know that we had interfered with it for our screening. And there was another scene, which I think was, I thought was funny at the time because of pronunciation, but she's in the bath and the creditors come and her agent says, uh, come out. And she says, I can't. I'm in the nude. And he says, well, get out of the nude. So we cut that too. So memories of 1953, wow. but splice here. So that kind of film, the documentary on Rob Murphy's journey, yep. Cinerama, all the changes, all those old projectionists from Melbourne who gather together, uh, Tarantino and uh, The Hateful Eight and all that preparation for screening it at the Sun at Yarraville. Uh, it was great nostalgia for me. Yes, I agree. Absolutely yeah. agree. Yep. Peter, I have a couple of foreign language films that Go for uh, it. I won't mention all of them, but some that I really enjoyed, like um, Farewell, Mr. Hapman, The Conference, <coughs> uh, A Hero, uh, Nostalgia, Full Time, Lunana. So uh, I, I don't know whether any of those were on your documentary list. Uh, no, but they're all good films. A Hero is not a documentary, though. No, I meant foreign language. Foreign language, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a Hero uh, the, was no, that, excellent, uh, yes. Yeah, Lunana I was thinking of as uh, a documentary. Right. Um, and whatever the language, everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> Which is I actually an American film. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, uh, and just to mention Depardieu, who was in Lost Illusions, May Gray, and uh, The Villa. The Villa I liked very much as well. Okay. And I thought it's extraordinary given his life and career, but there he is with such a variety of performances in the one year. So uh, I enjoy I enjoyed that as well. Yes. I've got two other thoughts. Sure. Um, I was surprised at the number of inverted commas horror films that I enjoyed in recent times. <laughs> but yes. um, I enjoyed um, I enjoyed Sissy, even though I think I shouldn't have. <laughs> but anyway, that was enjoyable. Yeah. And then Barbarian, which I was really taken by, and then Smile, mm. which I thought was pretty good as well. Yep. And the menu different category but perhaps in the same vein <laughs> yes. and the black phone and i thought in another year i don't know whether i would have commented on so many uh, horror terror films in the one year so i thought i'll mention that as well uh, look i agree um, horror has uh, been well treated this year uh, fresh was another one that comes to mind as well too is that this year already yes, yes. that must have been early in the year early. yes that was Yep. That was gruesomely successful. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> well, now, I don't know about taking up your time, but I've no got a few, uh, a few th more that appeal to me. Uh, the Outfit. Ah, yes. With Mark Rylance. I thought yes. that did very well as a thriller. Surprising yep. one. Um, I liked um, Del Toro's Pinocchio. Um, I couldn't believe a film, you know, set in uh, Mussolini's time and yes. Mussolini even getting his comeuppance. Yes. Uh, I enjoyed Amsterdam. Yep. Which I gather Americans didn't. No. I thought Blonde was very good. Yes. I thought Anna de Armas was terrific as Marilyn Monroe. I found it most interesting. I fully agree. That that film was really treated badly by a number of critics who just slaughtered it. I thought it was uh, yes. an excellent yes. film. Yeah, I thought it was very good. I put White Noise, which I saw recently. I don't know whether I was liking it while I watched it. But then finally I thought, this has a lot of interesting things. And I Googled the novel. And I'm amazed the screenplay adhered really to the structure of the novel. Uh -huh. and some of the events and characters much more closely than I would have thought. So I found that interesting, and 
I suppose as a portrait of America, I did find that worth seeing. And of course, the final sequence in the supermarket, the dance sequence, which was just hilarious. Oh, yes. I mean, when you think they were paying the budget for the film, <laughs> yes. and then I don't know how long the credit sequence went, for so five minutes at least, to pay all that money for so many extras to do a choreographed <laughs> complex dance in a supermarket. Yes. <laughs> but did you also realise that that supermarket was a complete construction? It was not... There was there was no real supermarket there, and all the eighties uh, foodstuffs etc. in there was all deliberately created and designed to uh, make it look as if it's a, a proper eighties supermarket. <laughs> so they spent more money on it even than I realised. Yes, it had a huge budget. I, I read somewhere about fifty million dollars or something. Dear oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> but- before I go, I do have some ones that I didn't really enjoy. Sure. Um, Thor, I thought was terrible. <laughs> With all respect to the director, whom I find funny at times. Yeah. But I thought, dear, oh dear, this is a bit silly to say the <laughs> least. I've not been very keen on the um, after series and after ever didn't appeal much at all. I wasn't taken in by Nope, I'm sorry to say. No. I really had hoped I would enjoy that more. Yep. Um, bros drove me mad, mainly the main actor. I really couldn't find any uh, empathy with him at all. <laughs> I mean, I sympathised with the story, but boy, oh boy, I found him very difficult. Were you engaged by him at all? I, I was, actually. I thought it was very cleverly written. Uh, it was very funny and uh, really nicely observed film. I liked it, yeah. Yes. I thought it would have been all right without him, but then it wouldn't have been any <laughs> film without him. But anyway, <laughs> what's his name again? I've forgotten. Uh, Billy. Oh, somebody. Oh, and so have I, too. So <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, off the Rails I didn't appeal to me all that much even if Judy Dench was in it. Yeah. How to Please a Woman drove me up the wall. Oh, I agree. Ugh. In terms of the horror films, Dash Cam, I didn't find uh, interesting even at all. Yep. And Bodies, 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 I thought was too silly. I, I actually liked and, it because of the twists in the story. <laughs> well, twists all right, but before you get to the twist, or <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> no, fair two, enough. Two, uh, two big budget ones that um, there was something to admire in each of them, but ultimately the Northman I really didn't like at all. Okay. And Stars at Noon, oh, I was me. wishing it would end. <laughs> it was on and on and on and on. Yes. So uh, you always feel guilty, of course, saying that about... Uh, you know, big budget and uh, high profile films, but um, yes, no, they, they, they yeah. weren't for me. Fair enough, yes. I and must sure I admit, I did like Top Gun Maverick after all. Okay, fine, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just a matter of watching Top Gun again and seeing it rehashed. So I thought <laughs> nothing new, but no, that, that's okay, it's, it's getting some accolades. I must ask you, what, how did you enjoy Avatar? The, the way of water? Um, I didn't, I didn't. Um, I realised I hadn't remembered anything much about the first one at all, um, nor how I found it at the time. Um, I found it interesting in the sense that he had kind of three films in one, that I found the first part, you know, the new arrivals and the building up of the industry and the guerrilla warfare against them. Um, so that was interesting, mm. but I was observing it a bit. Then we went for about an hour into the Blue Lagoon, and I thought, oh, well, they're asking us to be a bit more contemplative, and uh, the characters and the Pandora and the Sea Beast. And then, <laughs> as it built up with that pounding score, um, I found the battle to end all battles so uh, when you put that all together, I suppose, yes, um, 
I tended not to be drawn in as much as I might have expected. I admired a lot of the technique. I mean, the performance capture is extraordinary. Mm. His photography and underwater and the editing of the uh, that battle. Yeah. So much to admire, but not on my near top list. Fully agree with you. <laughs> I was Thank goodness we agree, Peter. That's a good sign. <laughs> we'll begin next year well. <laughs> okay. Uh, any any other films or shows or anything else you wanted to mention before we uh, conclude? No, that was it. I I jotted them jotted them all down. So uh, <laughs> I thought I'd better be ready. So uh, I gave it a lot of thought over the weekend and went through all the uh, lists of reviews for the year. So right. that's what emerged. Yes. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, uh, there's uh, quite a few films releasing for Boxing Day, and uh, um, I think we've seen some of them. So uh, it looks like a good release pattern coming up. Um, and the only one I've uh, seen is Puss in Boots. Ah, yes. <laughs> which I thoroughly enjoyed. I didn't mind it either. I thought it was nicely yes. done. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I thought it, it was well done. and I think yeah. adults would enjoy it. Yes. Uh, children would enjoy it, except the littlies. It was a bit scary for them. Yeah. But uh, no, I was surprised um, as I sat alone in the cinema watching it. <laughs> Oh dear! I saw it at at the uh, media preview, and uh, uh, a lot of kids enjoyed it, and some, of course, uh, overdid it. And uh, uh, anyway, <laughs> we won't go there. Universal asked uh, if we could give up our seat at that preview, even though it was at the Rivoli near me. Yeah, and it just suited a whole lot of other arrangements for the Sunday, ah. so I generously gave up my seat, for which they thanked me. And then uh, last weekend it was up at the uh, Baldwin, so ah. I ducked up and had a look. Fair enough, fair enough too. And can I recommend to you, uh, exclusively screening at the Nova from Thursday, is a brilliant documentary called Eternal Spring. All right, I shall give that some consideration. I don't know anything about it. I did it say no that I couldn't get to the preview. Uh, yes. <laughs> no, it's it's a Canadian filmmaker and it's about the Falun Gong in China and about the storming of a television station in China in 2002, I think it was. And most of the film is in animation because there's no actual footage and the oh, yes. animation is just absolutely brilliant. But the story is just incredibly heartbreaking and, and beautifully told. Oh, well, thanks for that recommendation, yes. Yeah, um, in the spring. Anyway, Peter, as always, great to talk to you and uh, I will certainly see you in the next weeks at the movies, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm not going to one tomorrow night. I can't get out on Wednesday night. Ah. I want to dance with someone. Oh, yes, yes, so, Whitney Houston, yeah. Yeah, so I think I'll be catching up with all those Boxing Day ones in the cinema itself. Right. Were you there last night for Man Called Otto? No, I saw it last week. I oh, saw it last week, right, yes. Yes. Well, I know there's an embargo on uh, talking about the film, so... <laughs> yes, it means I can't say how much I enjoyed it. <laughs> well, considering it's based on a Swedish uh, film, it uh, it actually did well, yeah. I yeah. thought it was good, yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> delete, delete delete no that's fine it's fine it's not as if we've done an extensive review or whatever <laughs> peter all the best we've been speaking to peter malone from the catholic film office uh film critic uh with his best and uh interesting and not so interesting films of the year uh and peter as always great to talk to you thank you have a good break and see you in the new year will do all the best bye-bye thanks peter thanks